We now join Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, Senior Pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ, as he brings today's message. Search us, O God, and know our hearts, and try us and see if there is any destructive, wicked way in us. When you find what doesn't belong, take it out, and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west, that it may never return again. I thank you, O God, for the privilege to stand behind this sacred desk. I am intimately aware that I am not worthy to preach your word, but I am grateful and that I can stand behind this desk this day. So I simply ask that you would send the angel by the name of Grace, the angel by the name of mercy, the grace and mercy may flank this pulpit. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength, and without a doubt, you are my redeemer. Holy Spirit, do thy will, do thy will, Holy Spirit. In the mighty and magnificent, awesome, majestic, powerful, and saving name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray people of God who love God may say, Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles with you, I would invite you at this moment to turn with me to the Gospel according to John, chapter 15. The Gospel according to John. Uh, it is also uh, printed uh, in your bulletin, but I can tell you that anytime you want to find uh, scripture, you can certainly find it in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> the Gospel according to John, beginning with verse 9. I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, bring together, it's the NIV reading, but uh, there'll be portions of the New Revised Standard and the contemporary English version uh, that I will interweave as we read, uh, just for greater context uh, for for our hearing on this day. And it reads as follows, uh, coming from uh, the Gospel according to John, chapter 15, beginning with verse 9. And it reads as follows. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love, Another translation is, now abide in my love. Or another translation is, now dwell in my love. If you keep my commands, if you keep my directives, if you do what I'm telling you, another translation, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in my Father's love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other. My command is this, love each other. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what the master, know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is my command. You are my friends. You are my friends. 
you are my friends. You are my friends. Love each other, for you are my friends. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Most High God. Uh, we, begin, uh, we began a new series last week uh, focused on the character of Christ. Uh, we had been in a series prior to that entitled, uh, I Believe I'm Being Called to Something, Looking at Purpose, Looking at Your Calling, Looking at What God is Directing You to Do and to how do you discern uh, that call, whatever it may be. We continue this series on the character of Christ because it is connected to the previous series. Because if you are to truly understand your purpose in God, you need to understand the character of God. And we want to deal with this little subheading here today, the subheading of being a friend of God or friend of God. If you could turn to your neighbor at this time and look at your neighbor, don't look at me, look at your neighbor. It is so funny how people all of a sudden just freeze up when I say that. Start trying to act like they're writing stuff down and everything else. And if you could look at your neighbor and just say, neighbor, neighbor. Old, neighbor. old neighbor, I want you to know you are looking, you are looking at, one at one who is, who is a, friend of God. a friend of God. Now turn to your other neighbor, maybe the same one, I'm not sure. It goes for Hope College up there. Find a neighbor, find a neighbor. Y'all got one? Y'all, you good? You good? Okay, all right. You got a neighbor. And look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, I know, I know. it's hard to believe. But I, am but I am besties with God. Besties with God. Amen. <laughs> Being a friend of God, the character of Christ. There is a writer, poet, and songwriter by the name of James Rowe. He migrated from England to the United States at the turn of the century. And I believe it was in 1912 when he penned a particular hymn uh, that has become a part of the hymnal or the standard Christian canon. Uh, much of uh, the hymns that is in the hymnal and those that we grew up with, uh, much of them are poetry that just happens to be placed to music. And when you, you listen to the poetry, uh, the depth of it, it has theology that helps us understand through imagery our relationship to God. And James Rowe wrote this poem that was uh, placed to music that many of you are familiar with, especially those who grew up in a church that had one of them red hymnals. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and the song goes this way, and if you know it, you are more than welcome to join in. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted. Now safe am I. Love, come on. Love, lift. When? Love lifted me. Now the power of this, this idea of love, that love is the foundation of the gospel, the center of our faith, the basis of our living, the centerpiece of our doctrine. All apologetics, hermeneutics, homiletics must be informed by love, shaped by love, defined by love, and spoken with an articulation motivated by love. Love is the alpha and omega uh, for our understanding and an encounter with God. Love even, Dr. Brown, uh, has the power to change your breath and rework the power of your lungs. Uh, that literally you will breathe differently when you know you're in love. 
uh, one of the great, and probably I would argue one of the greatest uh, saxophonists uh, to ever live is a person by the name of John Coltrane. John Coltrane from North Carolina, High Point to be exact. When Coltrane began his musical career, uh, it was noticed that Coltrane, there was nothing that Coltrane did that was remarkable. Musicians would hear him and say he knows the notes, he knows the chords, but there was nothing to indicate that he would be a musical genius because everything he did was mediocre. But several years later, uh, people who had heard him early on said something happened to Coltrane, that there was a brilliance in the way that he played, uh, and they were trying to figure out what happened to him. In an interview, uh, he said, well, once I fell in love with the music and I realized that I was loved by God, I then realized and understood that the saxophone was a vessel for me to use to communicate God's love because there are some things only a sound can communicate that words will never be able to communicate. And this is why John Coltrane eventually wrote Love Supreme, attempting to be able to communicate uh, sonically uh, the love that God has for God's people. And when we examine this particular uh, scripture, this word that we have here, uh, one could frame this as the farewell message of Christ, that he is on his way uh, to Calvary. He is going to die and to ascend to be with the Father. He speaks with imagery and passion before the disciples. Uh, the Gospel of John frames the speech uh, for those who are learning about Christ as an evangelist communicating to those who are not quite sure that Jesus is Christ. He uses deliberate and repetitive language uh, to drive home the character of who Christ is. John speaks with the language of love and action. It says here in the scripture, if you read chapter 15, he says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. He speaks also that at one point he will leave, but he will not leave you comfortless, that he will leave a counselor, a Holy Spirit uh, that will be with you. The, the image that he speaks of is an image of vines and branches and saying, Joy, that you've got to stay connected if you want to be fed by me and if you want to produce fruit. Uh, he gives the greatest directive when you move down to the verse in verse 9. From verse 9 through 17, he speaks with gentle authority of Christ's character. As the Father loved me, I too love you. Uh, if you remain in me, if you abide, if you dwell in me, if you immerse yourself, if you are enveloped, if you are saturated with my love, you will be connected to me. But, but he says, if you keep my commandments, and please do not get confused here, this is not the memory of certain words that you spout because you have memorized them. This means that when you keep the commandments, that literally your actions uh, demonstrate your connectivity to God. So it's not what you say, it is what you do. In other words, that your actions actually will be the only Bible that someone will ever read. And so how we live and how we act is how we open up scripture to someone. You can quote scripture all day, but no one will get a connection to God until they see you moving and acting with love. Then people will have connectivity to God. It's not what you say, it's what you do. As one old preacher says it, he says, you should learn how to preach a sermon and use words sometimes. <laughs> that it should be in your activity. And these actions, these actions are your scripture. And he says that I say this to you so that your joy may be complete because I want you to have my joy in you. 
And this joy that he speaks of is not happiness because that is momentary, that is temporary, that is temporal. But joy is that which is internal and also eternal. It is a deep wonder and satisfaction and peace at the same time that literally, as Brother Baskerville says, that you can have storms raging around you, but you've got peace inside because of your connectivity to Christ. When you are connected with God, in this kind of love. Ah, yes, he speaks of this, but he leads us to simply what he wants us to know in this farewell speech. He says this. He says something so simple but so profound, Monica. He says, love each other. But he does not say love each other, utilizing the Greek term known as eros, where we get the word erotic. This is not erotic love. He does not use the term phila, uh, where we get the term familiar or the love that you have for your children and for your family. He uses the term known as agape. That is God's love. That is love that demands respect and compassion, forgiveness and patience and grace and mercy all connected together. He says, love each other. In other words, do not spend your energy finding fault and failure with other people. Don't spend all your time on minor stuff, hurt about little things, majoring in what is minor, being angry and holding on to something that happened five years ago. Stop cutting your eyes at folks you still never spoke to, but you think they said something to you or didn't speak to you. Ah, learn to love each other. Uh. In other words, see everybody with potential and possibility. Uh, that even if they have not reached their possibility, see the potential that they have inside of them. In other words, live love, act love, and be love. It shall be difficult, but for those, uh, uh, for those who have been damaged by life, it's difficult to understand what love is all about. It is that great writer by the name of Elie Wiesel who says that the opposite of love is not hate. Says the opposite of love is indifference. Because at least hate has some passion around it. You even mad when you hate something, you mad that the person is doing whatever, whatever. But when you are indifferent, you don't care. You are resigned. You could care whether they live or die. You could care, don't care what they do. He says indifference is the opposite of love because it has no energy, it has no passion around it. And unfortunately, we do not know love, for we have been damaged by life, and we must learn to love. And he is speaking, saying to us, love each other. But, but that is not the key phrase that I want to uh, draw your attention to, to lift up to you so that uh, you may get something unique. I hope today uh, he says something that boggles my mind, the key in this text is that he says this. He says uh, that sets our hearts on fire and ignites something in Jesus. He says, you are my friends. When you follow my commands, I, I call you my friends. And one must understand this is the Greco-Roman world. And when you say that you are a friend in the Roman world, it means that you are a confidant. You are part of the inner circle. And when you say that you are a friend of the general, you are a friend of the senator, you are a friend of Caesar, it means that when you come into a room, people don't see you, they see the person that you are friends with, that you are connected to that individual. Ah, but this is bothersome to me. He says, I call you friends. Why do you call us your friends? It doesn't make any sense to me. I, it bothers me, actually. It, it, it's something about it doesn't sit with me. Why, why would you want to call me your friend? Why would you want to call us your friend? Because we have not always been a good friend to you, Jesus. We have not been a good friend to God. Uh, me, a friend. Uh, how could we? We are the ones uh, who've broken trust with you too many times. 
Uh, how often have we turned our backs on you and yelled and cursed in anger as, at people who look who have been created in your image? Uh, how often is it I thought we were hurting you when we said we would no longer come to church because we're mad at you or mad at somebody you created? Uh, we are always, we have not been good friends to you, but God says that you are my friend. Now, friends, according to my own definition, is ride or die. But the way we roll with God, we want to lift, but we don't want to die. We want God to be like a divine Uber. Take us where we need to go, but we don't want to ride with God permanently. Ah, something is wrong. God, why are you calling us your friend? Because we have not been good friends to you. We have a problem because when you have a friend, you're one, you will communicate with your friend. When you got a friend, you'll call your friend just to check in on them. When you have a friend, you are concerned about their well-being. We have not been good friends to God. But God says, you're my friend. Even though you've turned your back on me, now don't get all holy on me today. Try to act like you are Madam and Mr. Holy, that you have been the perfect person in your relationship with God. But truth be told, you have been consistently inconsistent when it comes to your relationship with God. You have not prayed every single day over your life. You have not been one studying scripture from the moment you were born. No, 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 no. There have been moments when you have been upset with God. There have been moments when you strayed from God. There have been moments when you claimed victory for yourself, but you knew it was God who did it in the first place. There were even times where you didn't even know how to say thank you for what God did for you. Some of you woke up today and just put on your clothes, got in your car, made your way over to church and didn't say thank you Jesus and I don't know about you but I'm grateful unto God that even though I am not the best friend to God God has been a mighty good friend to me and I'm not sure if there's anyone in here that can say God I thank you that you've been a good friend to me even though I have not been a good friend to you God dares call a fickle fan, a, a fickle fan as a faithful friend. Most of us are fans of Jesus. We are not a friend of Jesus. Fans want to stay up in the stands. Uh, but when the team doesn't do what you want them to do, uh, you will turn in your tickets and you will change your jersey. Ah, but God says, even though you're a fickle fan, I still see you as my friend because I don't look at you as you are. I look at you at what you can be. And I am so grateful. God does not hold my yesterday against my today, nor adds it to my tomorrow. Because if God took the resume of my yesterday, I wouldn't make it into tomorrow. But new mercies every morning I see. Is there anybody in here? Are you grateful for the new mercies that you see every single day? God dares call a fickle fan as a faithful friend. He says, you are my friend. You are my friend. And there are two things within the text that are connected to each other, to love each other and that you are my friends. If you follow my commands, if you are to live out the directives, if you saturate yourself and dwell in me, and in order to do this, we must, we must simply, this, that you must understand this principle that we must learn to love again as God's friend. It is scripture. It is Paul who says love is patient, love is kind, love does not keep a record of wrong. 
Love does not brag. Love is not insecure. Love is not uh, happy with injustice. Uh, love celebrates truth. Love endures all things. Love hopes all things. Love never fails. And even if you got faith and you got hope, the greatest of these is love. My father says it this way, sometimes your faith will go to sleep and sometimes hope cannot be found. But love is eternal and love will hold you till you get your faith back love will keep you till you find your hope once again because the love of God the love that God has for us is simply this that love is not codependent love is not manipulative love is not forced love is not accepting disrespect love is not being absorbed into somebody else love is not hiding your light love is not dimming your light love is not tolerance love is simply this love is learning how to argue you but still respecting the person you're arguing with love is having power but refusing to use the power that you have just as when Jesus was on the cross he had all power but he did not come down from the cross because he had power but he refused to use it because real love is the restraint of power not the using of power because in America, we are always focused on using power. Because when you're already insecure about who you are, you've got to use a limited vocabulary to convince yourself and everybody else that you're really a big man, even though you're a small man in a big position, that you shouldn't be there in the first place. Sorry, I went off script, but something told me to say that. And so one must understand uh, that love is not wrapped in all of this love is learning how to lower yourself but never lowering your standards let me see if i can help you out you learn how to lower yourself but you don't lower your standards uh, when elijah and michaela were much smaller i used to play something with them known as a knee football that's when dad would get down on his knees and we would play football. They would have a ball or something and they would try to uh, go past me. I was on their level. I could see at their level. Even though I was stronger than them, they could always make it past me because I was restraining uh, uh, my power. But eventually they would always say, daddy, we like you playing on your knees, but we want you to stand up. But when you stand up, we want to be holding on to you so that we can rise up with you at the same time. And what I love about this image is this is what happens when you hold on to God long enough that God will lower God's self in human flesh but when God rises up if you hold on to Jesus you will be picked up in the process and you will be able to see things that you never thought you would be able to see that your perspective will change Love is lowering yourself and never lowering your standards. But the other thing is, I think the best definition of understanding what love is, love is a good grandma. No, no, no. Love is a good Southern grandma. Love is a good black Southern grandma. That if you really want to understand love, you got to understand a loving grandmother. The kind of person who will encourage you when no one else will. The kind of person who can say, baby, it'll melt your heart and you'll feel all right. The kind of person who can whip up some things in the kitchen and serve it to you. And all of a sudden, you've got strength in your spirit when you just smell what grandma is cooking. And even though you will mess up in front of everybody, grandma will say, baby, that's all right. You my baby. And I know how good you are you can do it and you feel as if you can do anything when you got a good grandma I tell you good grandmas grandmas have power mm, you still missing me grandmas let me say it again have power mm, somebody knows what I'm talking about because you had a grandma it may not have been your biological grandma but you had an elder in your life who could pour into you and all of a sudden you stood two or three feet taller and said I can take on the world now because somebody loves me it is scientifically proven that grandmothers Dr. Brown have incredible power scientifically proven 
Because there was a child who was born with a neurological disorder, and in this neurological disorder, they figured that this child would not be able to have the appropriate coordination. Because the nervous system was not functioning well, the synapses were not uh, connecting and firing off, they assumed that this child uh, would have problems for the rest of this child's life. Uh, but grandma said, uh-uh, I, I, know the, I know somebody who is higher than anybody in this hospital right now. And grandma would come by every single day for several hours and would just hold her grandchild, hold her grandchild and talk to her grandchild. The grandchild couldn't talk back. She said, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, she would hold the grandchild and say, baby, you're going to do great things. I know what you're going to do because God sent you to us. And she would rock that child for weeks weeks and upon weeks but something happened when they tested the child weeks later they found out that the neurological disorder was disappearing they could not figure out why the disorder was disappearing they tried to make some type of scientific excuse with the assumption that well maybe it's because uh, uh, the touch of the grandmother was doing something but the grandmother said uh uh you see what happened was love got into my baby <laughs> and when love gets in you uh, it can change you physiologically it can change the way you operate and the way you live and that's what happens when the love of God gets into to your spirit it will literally change you that's why you look different when you're in love that's why you smile different when love is on you that's why you walk different when you've got love around you when love is in you around you and blessing you it changes who you are you don't look like yourself just tell them baby I'm in love <laughs> there's love in me it does something to you Ah, and the power of learning the power of love love each other and you you will be my friends I call you my friends and the simplicity of even learning simple words that we often are afraid of to say something like I love you As a matter of fact look at your neighbor right now and say neighbor I love you <laughs> look at your other neighbor and say neighbor I love you some of y'all got even nervous saying that, just saying I love you and whatnot. But I'm here to let you know that uh, this is the centerpiece of the gospel. When you learn how to speak love and live love and act love, it does something to your spirit. And so I must bid you farewell this day and let you go. Uh, but yes, uh, we must, we must understand uh, that God calls us friends and we must have a different definition of what love is. But as the church, the church must be a vehicle of love. So often there are other people who have the mic, who have defined the church as a place of, of hate, who have defined the church as a place of uh, where we stand and point our finger at other people and tell them they just need to be like us and everything would be all right. Uh, but that is not the kind of community Jesus was trying to build. Uh, Jesus was trying to build an inclusive community uh, where love was the centerpiece, where judgment was not at the front, uh, but love was at the center of everything that we do. And the church must be a vehicle of love. The church must reclaim this idea of love. Uh, with all of our doctrine and all of our apologetics, we must center who we are on this idea that Jesus is saying that you must love each other, but you also must learn how to love yourself and you must learn how to love the Lord your God. That love becomes central. And maybe one of the best ways to explain how we ought to operate is a story that I heard about a young man uh, by the name of Emmanuel. Emmanuel, I believe that when he was much younger, uh, he was this athletic uh, young man uh, among uh, all these sixth and fifth graders and whatnot in elementary school. Uh, he was much taller than everybody else, but he had a little friend by the name of Tommy. Tommy was real scrawny. Tommy was completely uh, uncoordinated. Nobody wanted to pick Tommy to play kickball, baseball, anything, or football, whatever. But, but, they, but it was Emmanuel who always made sure that Tommy's going to be on the team. Why? Because he's my friend. They grew up together. Their families knew each other. And it was his responsibility because his father told him, uh, told Emmanuel, you need to take care of little Tommy. Uh, even though he's not your blood relative, uh, he's been chosen as a part of the family. 
And so it was Emmanuel who was always sticking up for Tommy. It was Emmanuel who was also even sticking up for other young people in the school. But eventually there were two other young people who transferred into this elementary school. Now they were also coordinated and athletic, but they were also very mean. And they decided that they were going to change the pecking order in the school. And they knew that the only way that they could do that is that they had to remove a manual uh, from the pecking order. If people knew that Emmanuel was not as strong uh, as everybody thought he was, then they could be the number one bullies in the school. So they caught Emmanuel when he was by himself uh, in the corner and they were about to light in on Emmanuel. Uh, these two new boys, they were going to beat him down and bruise him. And as they were about to fight uh, Emmanuel, they heard a voice, a very squeaky little voice that said, Stop it! <laughs> looked around and said, Don't mess with my friend! And they looked around and was like, Where is this voice coming from? He said, Down here! And they looked down and there was Tommy doing like this. Tommy was like, Don't you mess with my friend! And they started laughing. And as they laughed, uh, they thought to themselves, we'll have to catch Emmanuel at a later time. And Emmanuel, when he walked over to Tommy, he said, Tommy, what is wrong with you? Why would you do something like that? When they catch you later and I'm not around, they're going to beat you down. He said, when they see you, they will see me. And they will want to hurt you because they want to hurt me. But then it was Tommy who answered in such a way. Tommy said, I, I had to because you're my friend. Even though I'm not as strong as you, but as many times as you've stepped in for me, as many times as you've protected me, as many times as you have blessed me, as many times as you've covered me, the least I can do is stand up for you when other people don't want to stand for you. I know I don't have strength like you. I don't have power like you. But I want you to know you're my friend and I love you. Well, there's somebody, another Emmanuel I know. There's another person I know who stepped in many times in your life. And if he stepped in many times in your life, every once in a while, you ought to stand up for Jesus you ought to stand up for our God if God's ever covered you and God's ever blessed you if God's ever healed you if God's ever moved in your life you ought to stand up just like Tommy you don't have God's power but God is our friend is there anybody in here do you know we serve a God who says I am his friend his friend God says to us you're my friend now a friend is somebody you can depend on but God has not been able to depend on us but you're still God's friend a friend is somebody who will always be there for you but we have not always been there for God but God says, you're my friend. I don't know about you, but it humbles me to think that God says, you're still my friend. Even though you don't act like my friend. Even though you don't roll like my friend. I know what you can be. I know what you shall do. I love the fact that our God calls us friend. A friend of God you are a friend of God and if you're God's friend then you should be unashamed and unapologetic to say that's my friend I love the Lord because the Lord heard my cry I love the Lord because he walks with me talks with me tells me I am his own is there anybody in here? God is my friend. God, and when the bullies come, don't miss this. Tommy knew if they show up, I've got somebody bigger than me who will always show up with me 
even if I'm bruised, my friend will tend to my bruises and protect me. We have a friend in God. That God is our friend. I am a friend of God. And God is our friend. What a wonderful thing to know that you are a friend of God, that you are God's friend. Simple idea that Jesus says that I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. He calls you friend. He calls me friend. Not just servant, he says friend. You're part of the inner circle. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. If you're a friend of God, just sing with us. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. 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 He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. It's that simple. I am a friend. That I am a friend of God. God. Now I need you to help us out. All right, balcony, you gonna help us out? Okay. Now, now, main floor, you're not gonna sing. We're just gonna have the balcony. Balcony, come on. We're gonna need your help. It's real simple. I am a friend of God. I want you to sing and raise the roof up. All right. I want you to sing, sing with some authority and power. Choir, don't don't, don't help them out. We we want to hear the balcony. So, so Brian, help out the balcony. We just balcony only. Sing it with some power. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, balcony. Now, everybody on the main floor, balcony. Thank you. You blessed us. Now, now, main floor. Y'all ready? Now come on, come on. Now, are y'all ready? Okay, okay. We're going to sing main floor. No choir. Main floor. We're going to sing. So we got to sing. Now the balcony did their thing. So now, now main floor. Y'all going to do your thing. You ready? Come on, Brian. Come on, Brian. Come on, main floor. Here we go. Here we go. One, two. One, two, three. Main floor. Now, choir, if they do a good job, you know, go ahead and encourage everybody, all right? Because y'all are professionals and everything. So they do a good job. So balcony and main floor, Brian's going to lead us. The choir is, y'all got some numbers to put up? It's like a nine, eight, you know, okay, okay, all right, okay, okay. All right. All right, balcony and main floor, let's sing this together. And let's sing it with authority and power because we are friends of God. Come on, Brian. Come on, Brian. Help us out. Here we go. One. Everybody, I am. I am Come on, everybody, I am a friend.
what's, what's interesting, now some of y'all remember back in the day in elementary school when you had a friend and they would do this, it's like, you know, you're my first best friend, you're my second best friend, you're my weekend best friend, and all of that. But the thing is that God doesn't do that. He doesn't create a hierarchy of friendship. That we are all God's friend. We are all God's best friend. And God does not put us at a rectangular table. God puts us at a circular table where God is in the middle and we are all equally distant from God. And no one is above, no one is below, no one is in front, no one is behind. We are all God's friend. And I am a friend of God and you are a friend of God. The door of the church is open if you're God's friend. You can enter into a new relationship today that you are God's friend today. Thank you for listening to this powerful and prophetic message from the Lord. To order a copy of today's message, please visit us at www.trinitychicago.org backslash Akiba. We invite you to come worship with us at Trinity United Church of Christ, located at 400 West 95th Street in Chicago, Illinois. For more information, call... 773-962-5650.